so today we are going to look at the gas behavior and we are going to combine it with other concepts we are going to look at gases first we're going to look at gases and stoichiometry and then we're going to look at gases and other concepts like density other concepts that we also have dealt with like molecular weight etc so we're going to apply what we have learned so far which has been ideal gas law PV equals NRT Dalton's sum of the individual partial pressures equals the total pressure combined law V1 P1 over T1 is V2 P2 over T2, those concepts that have already been addressed with old concepts like stoichiometry and density. Okay, so I am going to use the ideal gas law, which was what? Was the expression for ideal gas law? That's combined. V1, P1, when we have an initial and a final, that's combined law. PV equals NRT is ideal gas law. Okay, so ideal gas law, let's review that one. PV equals, let's just write. Okay, the one that you just told me, V1, P1 over T1 equals V2, P2 over T2 is combined. And the reason it's called combined is because it's combining boil, V1, P1 equals V2, P2 is boil. With Charles, V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. It's combining all the laws that we saw last time. Okay, so you have an initial volume and a second final volume. So you can have one and two or initial and final. Okay, so these three are the ones that we have seen. Dalton's law with P total is P1 plus P2 plus P3 plus P4 plus P5. You have five different gases. The sum of all five individual partial pressures will give you the total pressure. Okay, so we're going to use these laws that we've seen and apply them to all concepts like stoichiometry, like density, like molecular weights, things that we have already been exposed to. Okay, so we're applying what we've learned so far in gases. Next week in lab, you are going to be decomposing potassium chlorate. The decomposition of potassium chlorate gives you KCl. What's the name for KCl? Potassium chloride and oxygen. This, by the way, is the way industry produces oxygen. Okay, so you see a tank full of oxygen. Somebody filled it up, decomposing potassium chlorate. A triangle on the arrow means heat. You are going to do that. You, in lab, will get a test tube. And in this test tube, potassium chlorate is going to be placed. That test tube is going to have a stopper, and it's going to have a tube. So as you heat, you are going to heat this potassium chlorate. As you heat this potassium chlorate, oxygen is produced. And that oxygen is a gas, so it's going to travel through your test tube to a flask that's filled with water. And that oxygen is going to be collected and the water that's in that flask is going to be flushed into a beaker. So the volume of water in the beaker will equal the volume of oxygen that's trapped in here. So in this flask we're going to have water and oxygen. And the total pressure in there is going to be calculated using Dalton because you have water and oxygen. And um, okay, so P1 would be P of oxygen. P2 would be P of water. And the number of moles of oxygen in there could be used calculating ideal gas law. So if PB equals NRT, N is equal PV over RT. So the number of moles of gas. Okay, so the only gas, this is not a gas, this is a solid. This is not a gas, this is a solid. This is a gas. So the number of moles of oxygen. 
could be calculated if you know the pressure of oxygen, the volume of oxygen, and the temperature of oxygen. And you use R. Okay, so anytime the term moles comes into our universe, stoichiometry can pop up on us. Okay, so we need a balanced reaction. Let's go ahead and balance this reaction. If I have three oxygens before the arrow and two after the arrow, what do I put in front of the KClO3? A two. And before the oxygen, I put a three. And before the KCl, I put a two. So I am saying that two moles of potassium chlorate will produce three moles of O2. And O2 is a gas. And I can find out things like the percent purity of potassium chlorate if I know my moles of oxygen. And I know my moles of oxygen from the pressure of oxygen and the volume of oxygen and the temperature of oxygen. So we're combining stoichiometry with gases, with our laws, okay? So I am going to use an example that says like this. When a student decomposed 1.8 grams of a mixture, when a student decomposed 1.8 grams of a mixture of potassium chlorate, KClO3. So you have potassium chlorate and you have other deals in it. Maybe you have sodium chloride or something that's not going to produce oxygen. But it's not pure KClO3 what you have. You have a mixture. When they heat it up, the potassium chlorate decomposed and 0.405 liters of oxygen, and for oxygen I write what? O2, it's diatomic, remember your diatomic elements. And this happened at a temperature of 25 Celsius and 745 torrs. Okay, so when a student decomposed 0.18 grams mixture containing in potassium chlorate, okay, so this is in pure. This 1.8 was not just one potassium chlorate, it was partly potassium chlorate. Impure, 1.8 was an impure mixture of potassium chlorate. 0.405 liters of oxygen at 25 Celsius and 745 torrs were liberated, were produced. The residue, and here after you do your decomposition, some residue would be left. The residue weight Wait, wait. 1.282 grams. Okay, so that's your leftover in the test after you heat it up. If you started with 1.8 grams of your impure sample and you are left with 1.282, what happened? Why are those two numbers different? Why is before I heat it up and after I heat it up two different values? You lost oxygen. Oxygen is a gas and oxygen left. So how many grams of oxygen did I produce? How can I find out? I subtract 1.800 grams from my residue 1.282 so this is my original mixture. Okay, so this was impure. It contained potassium chloride, but it had all the other impurities in there. And this is my final residue after heating. So if I subtract those two, I come up with my grams of oxygen. 0.518 grams of oxygen must have been produced, were formed. How can I get the moles of oxygen if I have the grams of oxygen? Okay, the molar mass of oxygen is 16 times 2, which is 32, and it's 32 grams of oxygen in one mole of oxygen. Yes, we remember this? So if I have 0.518 grams of oxygen, 
and for every mole of oxygen I have 32 grams I am going to be able to get the moles of oxygen that are trapped in that flask that you will have collected 0 0.0162 moles of O2 from the decomposition of this potassium chlorate mixture okay what I want to do is I want to find how many grams of pure potassium chlorate and the formula for potassium chlorate is what again? KClO3 yes thank you KClO3 were present in the original sample okay and I'm gonna rewrite the balanced equation because it's way up there KClO3 goes to KCl and O2 okay so I know that I have produced 0 0.0162 moles of oxygen and I know if I balance this two moles of these two moles of potassium chlorate will produce three moles of oxygen. Yes? So I'm tying my PV equals NRT, my uh, amounts of oxygen, to get the grams of potassium chlorate. So if I have 0 0.0162 moles of oxygen, the molar mass of potassium chlorate, molar mass, is 122.6 of potassium chlorate. Okay, so if I produce point zero one six moles of oxygen, point zero one six two moles of oxygen are produced, how can I find out the grams of KClO3? You tell me. We have a balanced reaction and we rewrite the amount of oxygen, okay, so first I find the amount of moles of oxygen, 0 0.0162 moles, moles of O2, and then I need moles of O2 where? On the bottom, and moles of KClO3 where? On the top, and what are my ratios? 3 of oxygen to 2 of KClO2, because I have a 2 to 3 here, do we remember that, okay? Okay, and then once my moles of oxygen are gone, I continue. 122 is the number of grams in one mole of potassium chlorate. So I write one mole of potassium chlorate at the bottom. And what? 122.6 grams on the top. And now my moles of potassium chlorate cancel. So that's going to tell me how much must I had to begin with a pure potassium chloride and that gives me 1.32 okay so I found find how many grams of pure potassium chloride I did that now that's question A I'm gonna have three parts question B which is exactly what like what you're doing next week in lab find <coughs> the percent purity of KClO3. Another concept that came from our previous lessons. What's percent purity? Grams of pure KClO3, which I just found, divided by grams total impure mixture that I had originally times 100. Yes? Are we re okay with old concepts like stoichiometry, percent purity? Okay, so how many grams did I say? It was 1.32 grams of pure potassium chlorate. And I had started originally with what? 1.8 grams of mixture. So if I divide that and I take 
that into a percentage base, I get the purity of my potassium chloride. This is part of your experiment. So you're tying in, okay? And part C, are we okay so far? Any questions up to there? Yes. No, it, it cannot have oxygen, okay? So it's something like sodium chloride, that upon heating, nothing happens. It stays as sodium chloride, okay? It's, it's an impurity, but it is not going to affect the amount of oxygen. You can't do that. You cannot, you know, if you have something else that's producing oxygen, then you have to find out what is the relationship, what would be the stoichiometric amount between whatever substance you have in there, and then do another stoichiometric amount. But in your experiment, you won't have that. You just have impurities that do not affect oxygen. Any other questions? That's a good question. Okay. So another little uh, detail that you are going to calculate is calculate the empirical value of R. And the term empirical means in the lab, from your data, we know that R should be 62.4 liter torus over degree Kelvin mole, right? We saw that and we reviewed that a little earlier. But from your data, and you collected data in this experiment, and the number of moles of oxygen that you collected was 0 0.0162 moles, and the uh, pressure of the oxygen, I gave you the pressure of dry oxygen. I, in this example, I didn't use Dalton's laws to make it a little easier. And I had said earlier that 745 was the pressure of oxygen in Taurus. And um, I had also told you that the volume of oxygen from our original question was what? 0 0.405 liters. Okay, so that was in the original question. And the temperature was, I'm writing little t. Why do I write little t? I really mean uppercase t. So I want to make a distinction between Celsius and Kelvin. How do I go to Kelvin? I need to add 273. Okay, so whenever temperature comes my way in Celsius, I'm not going to write big T. To remind myself, I'm not done with my temperature, I must add 273 to it to get my Kelvin. Okay, so can I use PV equals NRT to find the value that you obtained for R with your, sure. I'm just going to get solve for R, so it's going to be PV over NT, and what's my pressure? 745 torres, and my volume 105, uh, 405, sorry, 405 liters, and the number of moles, 0 0.0162, moles of O2, and the temperature, 298 Kelvin. So my value of R, the one that I got empirically, would be found after I compute, multiplying 745 times 0 0.405, dividing it by 0 0.0162, dividing it by 298, and that gave me a 62.5 liter tor, liter tor per degree Kelvin mole. All of that is there. Okay, so you will, next week, use PV equals NRT, you will find your own empirical value of R, and check it. Do we know how to get percent error? If it's 62.4, the difference is 0.1, and 62.4 times 100, that's your percent error. You're off by a tenth. Okay, so you get that, and I will check the value of R, you can find the number of moles of oxygen, you can find the degree of purity of KClO3. The only difference from this example and the one 
that you're actually going to do is you are not going to be given the pure oxygen pressure. Okay, what you are actually going to be given is the total pressure. So you're going to have a barometer and your instructor in lab will read the pressure of the day. And then you will see, oh, at 25 degrees Celsius, which is the temperature, the vapor pressure of water is 24 torres. So then you would subtract 24 torres from the total pressure. But in this example, that was already given to you. Okay, so that's the only difference from this example to the one that you're doing in lab. Are we okay with this example? No big deal? Any questions in there? Okay, so let's continue in our little tour of applying the concept that we've had. We did stoichiometry. Let's move to other concepts like density and molecular weight and use our gases laws, ideal gas law, combined law, Dalton's law, there's one more law that we need to talk, talk about, but let's tie it into all concepts first, since we have a test coming up, and all these old concepts are important. Density and gases. What was the formula for density? Density was defined as the ratio of mass to volume. Okay. <clears throat> so if I have a question like this, short questions, but they got a kick. What is the density of SO2? What do I call SO2? Sulfite? Ideal meal. Is this an ion? In order for me to call it sulfide, I have to have a charge. Sulfide is SO3 minus 2. So no, this is not sulfide. Who is this guy? This is a compound. This is neutral. What is this guy's name? Sulfur dioxide. And if you miss this in the test, you're going to really be mad at yourself. Okay. Class A5. Step 1 is class A5. Don't name. And you're going to want to name it. And you're going to stop yourself. What is the density of SO2 at STP? End of the question. Don't you love these little short ones? Oh, like, okay, where do I start? Sulfur dioxide. Why do we know about sulfur dioxide? It's a gas. I want the density. I want it in grams per liters. We just simplify the math. Where do we begin? Molar mass of sulfur dioxide. Sulfur is 32, and I have two oxygens, which is another 32. So that's 64 grams in a mole. We know that STP means 273 Kelvin and one atmosphere, or 760 torr. What else do we know? Okay, so we... Write down everything we know. We know that density is mass over volume. And then we have our laws. Dalton won't help us here because that this is not a mixture of gases. Avogadro's talks about volume and moles. So I don't know the moles of oxygen here. So I don't know how to get to Avogadro's. I don't know the volume of oxygen either. Is combined law going to help me here? Do I have an initial and a final set of temperatures? And No. So this sounds like a, what? Like a BV equal, NRT equals type of deal. Because I have a pressure. The pressure is given. And I have a temperature. And I have some fellow called sulfur dioxide compound gas and the number of moles of it would be equal to the number of grams of it divided by the molar mass of it yes so PV equals are we okay so far okay so if I want density density has mass or grams 
over liters. This is my mass. And this is my volume. I'm going to combine that. Let me just rewrite it. Maybe, maybe not. PV equals grams over molar mass. RT. Okay, so this is still... N is grams over molar mass. Are we okay so far? I've done nothing. This is still ideal gas law. So instead of density, I'm going to swap these two. That guy's going to go there, and that guy's going to go there. So I'm going to go grams over volume. My pressure is still here. My molar mass is still here. My R that's multiplying in the right is going to go dividing in the left. And so is my T. And grams over volume is my density. Okay, so we're really squeezing brains here to get to old concepts like density. And can I get that? What's the pressure? 760 torres. What's the molar mass? Whoa. 64 grams per mole. What is the value of R? 62.4 liter torr per degree Kelvin mole. And what's the value of temperature? Standard temperature, which is 273. Very good. Okay, so I have everything. Okay, so, so far, all we did is plug in and <clears throat> are we okay? 2.86 is what I get in liters. grams per liter. My tours are canceling. These tours cancel. Let's use the colors. Moles, multiplying and dividing. Let's use more colors. Kelvin, multiplying and dividing. The only thing that's left is grams per liters. Okay, so my units are grams per liters. 2.86 is my final price. Okay, so good old concepts of stoichiometry. All you need is think balanced equation. Good old concepts of density. All you need is define density, grams per volume, and then add whatever else you've learned, like PV equals NRT, which turns into PV equals grams over molar mass, RT, because N is grams over molar mass. Not so bad? Okay, the other one that we wanted to look at was um, molecular formulas, another gases, and an old concept like molecular and empirical formula. So we're going to combine all concepts which we've seen in the past. We remember the, the steps needed to get um, to the empirical formula. We needed to find grams of every element. Then we needed to find moles of every element. And then we took the ratio in moles. And that would get us to the empirical formula. Yeah. So let's do that with gases, okay? <clears throat> All right. Analysis of a gas, of a gas, a gaseous uh, a sample, a gas sample, shows that it contains 85.7% and 14.3% hydrogen by mass. It 
if 0 0.188 grams of this compound occupy a volume of 109 milliliters at 25 Celsius and 760 Tor find empirical formula and find molecular formula. Do we remember this? Okay, so you're getting a new concept, gases, and the way it's going to click is when you tie it in with old ones. So you can apply it. Okay, so to get my empirical formula, I need the grams, the moles, and the ratio. But to get the molecular formula, I need the molar mass, don't I? I need the molar mass and the empirical formula and find out the ratio of the empirical formula weight to the molecular weight. Remember that? And it tells you how many times the empirical formula repeats itself. So how do I find my molecular weight? We just finished doing something very similar. This thing right here had molecular weight. Instead of using PV equals NRT, I'm going to use PV equals grams over molecular weight, RT. And there's a molecular weight. Do I have the grams? Yep. Do I have R? Yes. Do I have temperature? Yes. Do I have volume? You have pressure. So from this, you can get your molecular weight. You're going to need molecular weight and empirical formula to get the molecular formula. Okay, so let's find out what the molecular weight of this guy is. This gas. What's the molecular weight? Molar mass. Using... PV equals NRT or PV equals grams over molecular molar mass, RT. And I am just going to solve for molar mass, and it's going to be grams RT over PV. Are we okay there? All I did is manipulate the equation and solve for molar mass. Do I have the grams? Yes, 0.188. Do I have the temperature? Yes, but it's not in Kelvin. So what do I need to do to that? At 273, and that gives me 298. Do I have the pressure? Yes, I do. And do I have the volume? Yes, I do. So I have it all to get my molar mass. Are we okay so far? Okay, so all we need to do is make connections. And that's not easy. It's easy if somebody points out to you what the connections are. But you'll really understand it when your connections come your way without somebody else telling you what they are. Okay, so I'm going to put 0.188 per gram of this gas. My, my R is 62.4 liter tour per degree Kelvin mole. My temperature is 298. 298 Kelvin. My pressure is 760 torrs. And my volume was given as point. Was this milliliters? 109 milliliters, right? So I just converted to liters without a problem. Did you follow that? I just did that. Divided by a thousand. 109 mils. Okay, and there's in one mil, 10 to the minus 3 liters. So I converted to liters because my R has liters. Okay, you just put it in your head, divide by a thousand. And that gives you the molar mass. So the molar mass of this fellow is 42.2. Okay, so then I need to find what? What's the next thing I need to do? Find? The empirical formula. And how do I find the empirical formula? I need to find grams of each element. Then go to moles of each element and take the ratio. No big deal. My m grams are going to be my percents. Because I'm going to assume I have 100 grams. Right? Remember those? 
So if I have 100 grams of the sample, 85.7 are going to be grams of carbon, and 14.3 are going to be grams of hydrogen. So I'm going to use those as grams. Get rid of the percents and put grams in. So my next step is find my empirical formula. And since I have 85.7% and 14.3%, and this is carbon and hydrogen, I'm going to say that I'm going to have 85.7 grams of carbon, and I am going to have 14.3 grams of hydrogen. And my first step, find grams, is done. How do I go from grams to moles? Molar mass. And carbon has a molar mass of 12 grams in a mole. So moles is grams over molar mass. I said that many times. And I divide our hydrogen, one gram, one mole. So when I do that, I can go to moles from grams. I simply divide by the molar mass. And for carbon, I'm getting a 7.14. And for hydrogen, I get a 14.2. Okay, so I got my grams. I got my moles. Now I need the ratio. How do I get the ratio? This is my recipe for empirical formula. Divide by the smallest. So C is 714, H is 14.2. Which one's smaller? Carbon is smaller, so I divide both by 714. That, of course, gives me 1. And this gives me a 1.99, which I'm rounding off to a 2. So my empirical formula is CH2. That's my empirical formula. So that was one of my questions. What's the empirical formula, CH2? But my second question was, what is my molecular formula? So how do I get to a molecular formula? The CH2 repeats n times. And I don't know how many times. Does it repeat twice? Does it repeat five times, six times, three times? So I get my empirical formula weight, which is carbon, 12, two hydrogens, two more. That's 14. And my molecular, my molar mass was already determined. It's 42.2. So if I divide 42.2 by 14, I get the number of times that this formula repeats itself. And that gives me what? That gives me a 3. So that means that CH3, CH2, is repeated three times. So what is the molecular formula? C3H6. Okay, so good old concepts like density, good old concepts like stoichiometry, good old concepts like molecular formula, empirical formula can all be tied using PV equals NRT or using these concepts that we have been exposed to. <clears throat> yes? So far so good? Any questions so far? Not so bad? Okay, there's one more law in the gas chapters and we're done with it. So this is a quick one. This is new. This is Graham's law. Okay, so we're going into, we had combined law as Roman numeral one. I think we had ideal gas law as Roman numeral two. Is that true? We had Dalton's as Roman numeral three, so this must be Roman numeral four. Graham's law. And just like you guys told me Boyles and Charles and <clears throat> all this Dalton's law, you're going to tell me this one too. Imagine I have a glass tubing 
and in one end of the tube I have a little plug of a cotton impregnated with hydrogen chloride. Okay? I dip it on a hyd um, hydrochloric acid solution and then the hydrogen chloride gas is going to be traveling inside the tube. On the other end, I have impregnated a solution of ammonia. I have ammonium hydroxide solution, and the ammonia is going to be the gas liberated from the solution of ammonium hydroxide. Now, when HCl gas and NH3 gas combine, they're going to form NH4Cl. Is this a combination, decomposition, single, double replacement? What is this? Combination. And it's balanced. One nitrogen, one nitrogen, four hydrogens before and after the arrow, one Cl. This guy is a solid and it's white. So when these two guys combine, I'm going to see a white ring. So my question for you is, where is this white ring going to form? Let's pretend this is the middle of the tube. Is it going to form A right in the middle of the glass tubing? Is it going to form B closer to the ammonia end? Or is it going to form C closer to the hydrochloric acid end. So I'm going to see a white solid with my naked eyes. I'm going to look at this and see, oh, that's my ammonium chloride. Where is that going to be? In the middle? Closer to A or closer to B? What do you think? You tell me. These guys are molecules moving. What do we know about HCl? Tell me. It's a gas. It's hydrogen chloride. The molar mass is what? Good. Go. Hydrogen is 1, yes. And chlorine is 35.5. So that's 36.5. What's the molar mass of NH3? Ammonium hydroxide is a base. It's a solution. It's an aqueous solution. But the gas that evolves from it is NH3. What's up? It's 14. And 3 more is what? What's the molar mass of this guy? 17. Okay. So we write down whatever we know. If it's density they're talking about, we write mass over volume. If it's two gases, we write the molar masses. And then with that, we just keep going with that thought. Who's going to move faster? Somebody that weighs 36 or somebody that weighs 17? If you're going to run a marathon, what do you do? Eat a lot of potato chips and tons of sodas and... Lots of 48 ounce steaks and get like three heavy for this marathon? I don't think so. You get fit and lean and you're a lean machine and you fly. So who's gonna travel faster? Ammonia or HCl? Who's lighter? Ammonia or HCl? The lighter you are, the faster you move, no? So who's, where's the ring going to be? Okay, so you think before you answer. I don't care if I'm asking how to name SO2 or what if I'm asking where's this ring appearing. Write down whatever you know of that subject. And it may be from way back when. And that's what we did today. Went through history lane and that's what this course does. It takes you through history lane. So by the time... Ammonia is way over here. HCl is still crawling. And that's the correct answer. That is Graham's law. It says <clears throat> that when two gases intermingle, they're diffusing. It talks about the diffusion, the rate of diffusion. Okay, so if this is gas A 
and this is gas B, because they don't have to be ammonia and HCl, it could be any gases, okay, any gases, oxygen O2, hydrogen H2, SO2 is a gas, CH4 is a gas, any gas, let's call them A and B. The rate of diffusion of right gas A in relationship to the rate of effusion of gas B is inversely proportional to their molecular weights and it's equal to the square root of molecular weight of B over molecular weight of A. That's Graham's law. Okay, so if I ask you to calculate the rate of effusion of CH4 to that of SO2. I want you to put CH4 in the numerator for rate of CH4 and the rate of SO2 in the denominator. And how do I get that? I need the molar mass of this fellow, and what's the molar mass of 12 plus 4 is 16, and what's SO2? We had it earlier, 64, 32 plus 32, yeah? So what do I write on the bottom? 16, and what do I write on the top? 64. I compute, that gives me a 4, square root of 4 is 2. So how do I say this in words, and this is the catch? This is the grand finale, because this is how your questions are going to start. The rate of effusion is 2, so that means what? This guy is called methane. CH4, or methane, diffuses, effuses, moves, twice as fast. Twice means 2 times faster than sulfur dioxide. Okay, so I can give you a question that talks about this gas effuses two times faster than this other one or 3.5 times faster than this other guy. What, if this gas is hydrogen, what's the molecular weight of the other guy? So I can give you the answer and then you find out that could be X or that could be X. I could ask molecular weights doing that. Okay, this is pretty much <coughs> the bulk of the gas chapters. If you have questions, please come see me. Have a wonderful day. I'll see you next time.